Hello, I'm Richard Vobes and this is my story, a continuation of the story of behind the life, I suppose, behind the Bald Explorer. I've been doing some of these and uh, with your indulgence, I shall continue. This one is um, another film making story. I know some people go across the world exploring mountains and they go in the jungle and they, they have these amazing life experiences. My life has been following, um, I suppose, my career. And so while I haven't got those sort of stories to tell you, I've got these unusual things, I suppose, that I have done, perhaps not unusual for many people who do similar things to me. In my last episode, I told you about um, a, a Super 8 video, it's not a video, a Super 8 film that I was making with the local cine club and it was called Plug Your Ears in which uh, a pen load of pensioners uh, and I made this video and they had stockings over their heads and all of that. Well, it's, I'm pleased to be able to tell you that one of my viewers has come forward with a film encoding machine and uh, we're going to get together and actually encode the, the Super 8 film and turn it into video. And I can finish the thing by putting some audio and music on it and people can see what I was up to back in 1991, I think it was. Around about 1992, having really struggled with that, and still wanting to get back into film, but doing things a little bit more seriously, I realized that Super 8 was just not going to do it for me, that I needed to move into a better medium. Video was not really an option, and I loved film. I just loved the process of working with film and also the look of film. And back then, of course, film still looked, unless you had lots and lots of money for the latest um, video stuff. Film still looked superior. And, uh, you know, in many ways it still is. It's a fantastic medium. And so I wanted to work on 16 millimeter. Now this is professional film grade and costs a lot of money. And there was only one way that I would really be able to do this. And, and that was to put some money into it and get a proper crew. Otherwise, you're just going to be making a bit of a home movie and it's gonna look rubbish. I'd written a script. This was a ghost story called A Cry for Help. It was a story of um, a, a couple that moved into a, a new house and the male of the couple kept hearing these noises in the night and he discovers that there's a ghost in the house. It's a ghost of a little girl who was bombed during the Second World War. And she's stuck in the house and she's calling for help. And he doesn't really know how to help her, but eventually he realizes that he has to do something. And I can't remember now uh, exactly what it was. It was a while ago, but he has to do something in order to release her from this being trapped, I think. And if I remember rightly, part of the film script is he somehow ends up going back in time. And I think he has to take this lintel of a, a house that's collapsed on her off and that will release her. I mean, it's a bit of an old hackneyed sort of story, I grant you, but it was a long time ago. Anyway, it's quite an ambitious thing to do, but I wanted something that would inspire people to help me make this video or this film. So I needed a crew and I didn't really know any people. So I started to advertise. One of the things I did was I got in touch with the local paper and said I was gonna make this film and I wanted a, a team, I wanted to set up a group like a club, if you like, but I wanted it not to be retired people who were working and doing um, holiday films. I wanted it much more uh, younger people who were a bit more career minded and a bit more professionally engaged with it. So we set up something now, I can't remember if it was the Sussex Film Foundation or the Sussex Film Group or something like that, I called it. And I was working with a bloke um, who was an actor 
who I knew on the amateur drama scene who was getting into acting professionally. So I said, look, if we do this, this could be good for you as a showreel. And he said, yeah, he would love the idea. So that was that was the overall concept. We we advertised in a few places. I can't remember now exactly, but we had I had this one feature in the in the paper. And I remember the photographer came here and a reporter came here to my house and pretty much where I'm sitting now, I seem to think, remember, I had this, I think I had an old Super 8 camera in my hand with the wall behind me. And there was a picture of it in the paper saying that I was setting up this uh, Sussex film group. Anyway, um, that was, that was, um, what, what went out. We managed to get a whole load of people together who were interested in this, both crew members and actors as well, who would take part in the video. We, I remember down in, um, in the Steen Gardens, I think it was the Arlington Hotel, we booked a room and we got everybody to arrive on this day and we put forward our proposal, what we were doing, had copies of the script, had coffee and all of this. It was all very, all very nicely done. I have to say it cost arm and a leg, but it was all very nicely done. And people came in and people showed their enthusiasm. And then uh, because it was before the internet and before Facebook and all of these sort of things, we kept in uh, touch by, uh, I guess, by some sort of newsletter thing. Can't really remember, but Anyway, we put this schedule together. Mostly these were fairly local people. So we put this schedule together and we had, I had a cameraman who had worked on 16 millimeter, a young bloke. I had a guy who was keen on lighting. I think uh, an ex student who'd done some lighting. Um, we had a makeup lady who was a professional makeup lady and was keen to sort of do some film work. Um, and a whole bunch, basically a whole bunch of people. Um, who all had rel related tasks. Uh, the, the, my main actor friend, whose name was Mark Kempner, um, he's, his wife, not his real wife, but the character's wife, um, answered an advert and came from Australia, who was over here for a short period. Her name was Chelsea, I seem to remember. And she stayed, and it was, it was amazing. We had this wonderful team um, of people. And then we had to have places to film, obviously, and we needed to have the equipment. Well, we were using one of the chaps from the Cine Club, who I knew quite well by now, and I said, is there any chance we can use your house? And he said, yeah, you know, of course. He was more than keen. 16 mil, you know, he wasn't used to having 16 mil before. It was just the sort of wind up Super 8 stuff. So that was great. So we had his house as the house that was going to be the one haunted. Um, we needed some equipment. Now I'd found a place in Brighton that hired a Ariflex BL, which is an old, I suppose, 1960s, 70s, 16 millimeter camera. In its day, it was the bee's knees. Um, had great big reels that you had to put on in a changing bag in a magazine. It was, oh, it was all real proper hands-on film stuff. Um, and I think they also rented out a, a, an edit suite if you wanted to use one of these edit suites. Well, I'd, somehow I'd managed to get hold of something called a Steenbeck. Now, Steenbeck, you'll often see interviews when people are, not so much these days, but in the old days, you see people being interviewed, directors sitting at a Steenbeck, which is a flatbed editing table and you would have rolls of film instead of being upright like this they were this way they were horizontal and rolls of mag magnetic tape that also had sprockets in so that you could synchronize your picture and sound and you would play them together and there would be a screen um, great big flatbed thing this had um, this was only four I can't remember what they called it now but four reels on it so you could have two of film one with the film starting and one on the take-up spool and the same with the mag uh, which was the the, the audio um, so you would record audio on a reel-to-reel -reel, um, and we had one of those on a special reel-to-reel -reel, whose name now I've forgotten what the name of but it was um, we we I think originally we rented one and then 
I bought one, a second hand one I found. Not a ewer, that's the name of one, but there's another name and I can't remember. Nagra, Nagra. That was it, and that was another industry standard thing. These were sort of a bit out of date, but it still worked. So you'd record it on quarter inch magnetic tape. Then you would have it transposed, transposed or dubbed onto this mag, which was taped with sprockets on so that it could sync up with your original 16 mil film. It's, it's quite a complicated process. And when you've filmed, you're filming on negative, uh, which I was, you, I managed to get short, what they call short ends, which was from the BBC. So the BBC at that time would be going out, they would film something and then they might have a 400 foot roll of film, but they may only use 100 feet of it. And so they would put that back into stock to be sold on because every time they went out, they always wanted to have a 400 foot roll. Um, they wouldn't want to go out with you know the remains of something but those remains could be sold to people like me um, who were making films so it was a way that they got their money back so I would get all these different short ends and you could uh, then use all these up and make your video your, your, your film see how video now is so ingrained anyway uh, so that was the process and then you would take those negatives once you would filmed them you would send them to the lab and then you would be supplied with rushes we've all heard the term you know or dailies as, as I think the Americans call them but uh, rushes where they rush a print from the original negative and they send that back and you can project it to look at what you've done so that was a quick return round because you obviously you you know you didn't want to do that posting it off to Hemel Hempstead uh, in an orange envelope and wait a week like you were doing with Super 8. This was a, a proper professional service but it cost a lot of money so we had a very limited budget. I remember putting in the money. I, as far as I'm aware it was all my money but there may have been other people who contributed. I can't remember and I don't want to miss appropriately and just say, say it was all mine but Anyway, um, it pretty much was my money. And so we had a very limited budget. We had the film stock. We would uh, have the, the rushes sent to us. And then once you did that, you would then edit up uh, those rushes. You would edit them and mark them with China Graph pencil on the actual film footage with proper trim bins and all of this. It was just like Super 8, but a bigger. It wasn't 35 mil, it was 16 mil. And then you would send that off and then using the negatives that they've stored, they would then edit together using the negatives and a, and a neg cutter, which was quite a skilled operation, would put that together and you would end up then with your master print. Well, this project never got that far. Let me just say that to begin with, which was a shame. However, we had this crew together and we went off and we started to film. And, uh, and as I say, I was pretty much directing and producing. Um, I had the cameraman and a lighter a, a lighting chap and we had a, a bunch of other enthusiastic people and we filmed one of the places we filmed was at uh, Tangmere Museum in actual fact because I remember there was a scene in which the hero had to go and chat to somebody at the Tangmere Museum to talk about ghosts and how they had got rid of ghosts there I think I can't remember it was all part of the plot but the main thing the main interesting thing was we needed to recreate the house that had been bombed that the little girl was stuck under the lintel as a ghost and that the main character who was played by my friend Mark had to step back in time somehow and I think he just wakes up I can't remember I think there's an air he goes to sleep and there's an air aid warning and he wakes up and he's actually in the house because I think the modern house had been built over the house that had been bombed and she was still in the house. I think that's how it worked. But we needed to recreate that. Now, up along the A27, big road that, by, that sort of goes from uh, Brighton to Chichester, uh, just north of Worthing, there was a, a, a burnt out house. It was a big palatial house, I think, that in the 70s was owned by, now, I may get this wrong, but um, a big chain store I don't want to mention the name of the chain store but there was a big chain store and one of the owners or proprietors had a house there as far as I'm aware and it burnt down about 
10, 15 years ago and um, had just been left like that. So um, we knew about it. And so I got in touch with the people who were managing it and the managers uh, came back to me and said, well, you can film there, but we're not going to give you permission. In other words, if you were filming there and something happened, we don't know anything about it. It's down to you. But uh, if, if, you're, if it's reported to us that you're filming there, we're not going to do anything about it. So in other words, it was a way of them giving permission from us to film as long as they weren't responsible and that we took all the, the responsibility. So we said, yeah, that'd be great. Um, we, I wrote my letter to the police and sent it off to the head of police, which was at Lewis, to say this is what we're doing and we're going to do it on these nights. And um, that was all great. We hired lights, we had generators, we had our uh, 16 millimeter camera and um, we were all in there at, in the dead of night. We had smoke machines, so we had smoke and all of this. Um, there were these burnt out rafters and, and all because we wanted to make it just been bombed. And we had all and it looked incredibly atmospheric and uh, the actor, we had various shots of him walking through the smoke and the light shafts of light. It was great. Um, and then I remember the cameraman whose name was Ollie, as I remember, we wanted to get a shot looking down to see him and the girl, this little girl. And he, we, we climbed up on these rafters. We didn't know whether it was going to be safe or not. No one had done a, a safety assessment on the place. I mean, it was, it was real guerrilla filmmaking as such. And, and again, the police turned up and they said, oh, we've seen, you know, lights have been reported in here. And we explained what we were doing and they were fine about it. And again, I said, I have written to you, I've told you. And they said, oh, this often happens. But anyway, so we were fine. We filmed all the stuff we wanted to. Um, and it, it, we just had a hoot. I remember it was freezing cold. Um, I don't know what, what time. It must have been in the winter. It was freezing cold. We we're all on um, in our gloves and things. And uh, but it, it looked fantastic. The rushes came back. And as far as I remember, it all looked great. The project ran out of money. That that was the thing. And we got all this stuff and the intention was to raise the money to get it developed um, and, and put together. And I think there was perhaps one or two little scenes to put together. But the impetus, I don't know, because it was over several weeks, this, it wasn't like we were focused on one week, shoot it all in a week and finish. And I think people had other things to do and it became, it just was one of those projects that unfortunately suddenly one minute it, you're doing it and the next minute there's became difficulties, no money and, and it never got finished. And I've got, still got those rushes. I don't have anything to play it on like 16 millimeter a projector. I did have one, but unfortunately that's broken. So again, I would love to get that digitized and see how much of that could be restored, even if it was only to demonstrate. Um, I have somewhere, and I did try to look before I did this, uh, the cutting um, about uh, this um, video that where it's me in the, in the thing, but I can't find that. That's probably in some of my papers somewhere. So I will find all the, I will dig all these things out, but anyway, so that was that was that. And it was it was a wonderful thing. The group slowly disbanded, but I was friendly with many of the others. As a result of this, though, through a contact or a friend of a friend. My first, if you like, professional engagement to make a video and film came about, funnily enough, for Tarmac Roadstone. They wanted a safety film which showed what would happen if kids got into their big sand pit and some of the, um, I don't know what you call them, they've got these sort of pools where the sand is settling and the quicksand. And they said, would, we be, would I be interested in making a video? And they would pay us. And, um, and I said, yes. And I shall tell you about that production because that's a fascinating thing. And, and again, 
somewhere I've got video and, and somewhere I've got, I know I've got the roll of film and somewhere I've got pictures of us filming it and I will look to see if I can dig them out. So I leave you with that little cliffhanger of one of the other projects that I have done. Anyway, thank you for watching. I hope it was enjoyable. Um, it's, it's really sometimes pulling out these memories from, uh, from all these time ago is just fascinating. Uh, don't forget to follow, like and subscribe. Uh, give me a thumbs up and I will catch you later. Bye for now. Bye bye.